Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. And I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, um, also La Sierra, mm -hmm. and Associate Director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology. Great tour guide. You, I think you're keeping as busy doing tours these days as, as maybe anything else. A couple uh, of spring. Yeah, I think you're working hard on that. <laughs> and our guest, ooh, although you are part of this ongoing conversation with the um, Bible and archaeology inter uh, interface, right. and so I don't know if we can call you guest. You're, you're part of this team. <laughs> part of the journey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kent Bramlett, uh, Associate Professor of Archaeology and the History of Antiquity at La Sierra University. We are walking through the Bible, and we have been through some fairly rough territory with right. the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. uh, Joshua and Judges, but especially Judges. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mischief and mayhem mm -hmm. in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. We turn our attention uh, for this episode to the story of Ruth. What a nice so, contrast. Okay, <laughs> uh, what I wanted you to do is say how you feel about the Book of Ruth, maybe even in the context of the Book of Judges mm -hmm. or the time of the Judges. Uh, how, do you, how do you like Ruth, and, and what do you like about that particular book? Well, it is a, a, a real contrast with what we've done, been talking about in Judges. Some of those stories I remember as a child were very hard for me to take. I didn't, I didn't want to be at worship when my dad read those <laughs> stories from the Bible. But when we got to Ruth, that's a beautiful story. Um, you uh, uh, are intrigued by what the storyline is, and uh, all the characters in the story seem, uh, you know, uh, likable, and it's a uh, a beautiful thing. And, and, and fairly pleasant. And pleasant. Right. And so you did come down for worship when your father I did. read I from did. the story. I did. <laughs> Kent, what does Ruth mean to you? Well, it's a beautiful interlude. Um, not just a transition from judges, but I think it's key in that, in that movement towards the kings. Mm -hmm. So we have this sort of idyllic, well, there's, there's a troubled undertone, but it ends well. Mm -hmm. And it leads then into the transition of the kings, where we have a few more rough stories along mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. But Ruth itself is a beautiful narrative. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, judges ends kind of hoping for a king. Mm -hmm. um, and I like your word interlude. It's, it's there. It's a beautiful pastoral story. Maybe, maybe some of the best literature of the of the Bible. I mean, the story, the pastoral theme, um, coming almost in a comedic fashion from what was good into disaster, but then coming back out. But the reference to King David at the end. Mm -hmm. So there is hope, mm -hmm. even in the time of Judges, when they're looking for a king. Well. Maybe we have one mm -hmm. on the way here. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there's just that flow, in, and certainly the way the, the, the biblical books have been put together, right. it right. connects well. We have a few, not a lot, of artifacts uh, on the table in front of us. Uh, Kent and Larry, talk to us about these artifacts. They, they are intentional in terms of the story of Ruth, although one of them is a little bit uh, pushing the edges, but talk to us about these artifacts. Well, I'll start with this over here, which is a chalice, you know, that uh, would be on the table with some fruit, perhaps, or something like that, if it were used at home, which they often were. And here you have a bowl that uh, has all kinds of uses, but uh, typical of the period. And you could say that they would fit into the story of Ruth very nicely. Right. right. They're, again, Iron Age period, that is, right. time of the judges down through the kings of Israel. So they fit within this storyline. Here we have a lamp. And I don't think lamps are mentioned in Ruth, but they certainly fit in this story. Mm -hmm. We have yes. darkness, we have nighttime, and in the ancient world, when the sun goes down, um, light is scarce. Um, after all, it's expensive to burn your olive oil as a fuel just to see. So it would be used um, sparingly. In, in the Psalms, when David talks about the God's word being like a light onto his path, mm -hmm. he's thinking of a lamp like that, isn't he? He is, mm -hmm. right, certainly. And here's a small uh, juglet, a, a dipper juglet, 
Uh, you would use a vessel like this to pour olive oil, perhaps, um, so you could dip your pita bread in it. Um, sometimes it might have ointments in it. Mm -hmm. But again, these are fairly everyday vessels, except for this, uh, the chalice. It tends more toward mm -hmm. worship settings, doesn't tends, it? Tends more that um, way. But it's certainly elegant mm -hmm. and could uh, perhaps show up. I think archaeologically, it often shows up in worship settings, mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. cultic settings. But but you've, you've left out my favorite one here. We, uh, want, we knew you uh, wanted you, to oh, talk about okay, that. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> the, the grinding stones, the lower grinding stone and then an upper millstone, and some grain. We put some wheat in here. This is not ancient wheat, but uh, the stones are. And these are ones that we excavated mm -hmm. at our site. And they illustrate, all of these things illustrate so well life in the time of Ruth. Mm -hmm. uh, from kind of the late judges period into the time of the monarchy, but certainly it includes the, the time of Ruth. Mm -hmm. um, and daily life sorts of things. That's what you expect from a, a pastoral story like we have in Ruth. Mm -hmm. So lots of uses. These were life. Uh, the life was dependent on these. If you didn't have one of these, you could not grain your, uh, ground, uh, grind your daily uh, mm -hmm. bread. Mm -hmm. And hours many times every day for a medium or large sized right. family. Right. Now when Ruth was gleaning in the field of Boaz, she would have picked up some uh, something like that, wouldn't she? And then beaten it out and put, put it there to make her grain, yeah. It's actually a long, tedious, and labor-intensive process. It is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not only growing, as planting, of course, well, preparing, okay, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get this all in order, uh, preparing the soil, and then um, uh, planting, and caring for, protecting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are threats to um, crops. And then, of course, the, the hard work of harvest, of threshing, uh, separating out, and then now it's ready for the kitchen, but there's more hard work to come, and that is grinding the stone, uh, grinding the grain. Now, when, when you look at these, the Bible talks about 20-fold, 30-fold, 40-fold, and so on. I suppose it's talking about what's contained in one of these uh, heads, right? Good point. Yeah. Good biblical connection. Mm -hmm. Well, then let's think about uh, and come back to the, the story of Ruth itself. Walk through the basic narrative line. Um, Larry, lead us, we'll fill in if we need to, but what is this basic narrative line of the story? Well, Naomi's a woman uh, who uh, grows up around the Bethlehem area with her husband, and uh, they have two sons. The uh, reason for their departure, I guess, is a famine that was in the land, and they thought, we better head over across the Jordan River to our neighboring state of Moab, where maybe we can get some work and at least some food. And uh, the young men grow up there and uh, get married there. And Ruth is uh, one of the, the wives of one of the sons. And uh, is it Orpa is the yeah. other right. uh, uh, woman. And uh, they get along there uh, well until uh, Naomi's husband dies and uh, the two men, the two sons die too. And uh, it's a difficult place for these three widows mm -hmm. who in that culture were very connected and dependent on their men for just about everything in life. And so it was an unfamiliar place and I guess uh, uh, Naomi decided it was time to head back to where her family was back in Bethlehem. And so she encouraged, gave, gave the two women their freedom. You stay here, um, maybe find another husband, you're young, and I'll go back to Bethlehem. But one of them, as we know, Ruth would not think of that. She said, wherever you go, I'm gonna go, and I'm part of your family now. And so they, the two of them, mother and uh, daughter-in-law, headed back to Bethlehem. And uh, there, uh, Naomi, knew about Boaz, one of her family members, and she said to uh, Ruth, why don't you go glean in his field? I'm sure that, you know, he won't mind. And that's where the story sort of develops, and they become friends and ultimately um, husband and wife. Uh, after he checks out with the other relatives to see if there's somebody closer who can, uh, as the story says, redeem her, uh, be her next of kin. 
So he couldn't find anyone who was, was closer, who was willing to assume that responsibility. And so it sounds like not only fulfilling a responsibility or the duty of a kingsman or a redeemer, but they actually fell in love, it seems like, that they, you know, enjoyed each other's company. And out of that union came uh, down the line David, a king for Israel. So it's a beautiful story. Good. Nice, uh, nice way to put it, Larry. There, uh, what I think about as you were walking through that, um, the tough times, yes, of the deaths, mm -hmm. but the tough times because this was crossing borders. Um, and you have Moabite mm -hmm. and what we would, what Jude ultimately Judahite. becomes mm -hmm. uh, Judahite mm -hmm. or Israelite. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that process, were these happy people together? No, no. at least m much of the time they were right. not happy together. Mm -hmm. In fact, Moabites were not supposed to come into worship services mm -hmm. in Israel right. under the 10th generation. I mean, wow, <laughs> talk about uh, exclusivism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I think about that level of tension. Mm -hmm. What else jumps out as Larry has now walked us through the story? Well, the bereavement in the foreign land, uh, I mean, that sets up an emptiness, right. which I think accentuates then Ruth's desire to go with her mother-in-law back to Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And one wonders why they went across for the time of the famine. They develop connections over there, but then there's the family catastrophe. Right. So then it's time to go back. Ruth, uh, uh, well, Naomi doesn't expect her daughters-in-law to come with her. No. And so there's that dialogue, that gripping dialogue, and Ruth chooses three times um, yeah. she right. Um, she chooses, she affirms her desire to go back mm -hmm. with her mother-in-law. Some, some literary uh, specialists have added another layer and picks up on what you said about famine. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the chapter one, in many ways, is famine kind of to the max, mm -hmm. uh, writ large. Uh, there's a famine, a physical famine of food. Mm -hmm. There's a famine in the family because of the deaths. Mm -hmm. And there's a family in a larger social context too, mm -hmm. uh, at least if this book is placed there for a reason, leading to a king. Mm -hmm. Because right. everything is endangered now. Mm -hmm. um, and then chapter two tends to fulfill the first level of famine, physical. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, especially the scene, the night scene at the threshing floor, mm -hmm. we're now thinking, okay, family is gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. This romance is right. developing. Uh, and then by the time we get to the um, end of chapter four, then there is a political thread. And, and all of them built on this notion of famine and fullness. Mm -hmm. So that we come out of this book feeling actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's a good sense that uh, God has things under control, although God only does one thing in the book. People attribute God for doing different things, mm -hmm. you know, may the Lord watch over you and mm -hmm. so on. God only does one thing, and that is to give conception. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop and think about how important that is in mm -hmm. the story too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great story. I think it's the greatest story. Yeah. Uh, Certainly in the, in, the, yeah. in, in the Old Testament, maybe in the ancient world, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're gonna have to tell me, you're reading some more of those stories than I am. Um, well, it's, one wonders the stories that weren't uh, passed down. Right. I mean, this comes from Bethlehem, it's from the, the ancestors, the immediate uh, second, third generation before David. And so it's been preserved for those reasons. But yeah, it's one of those heartwarming stories that would have been lost because it doesn't have, other than the establishment of David's right. lineage, it doesn't right. have the grand narratives that one might expect of kings and battles. Now, as, as we know and have just told the story and thought about it, has archaeology helped us at all? See, I think uh, that's our question. That and that's what we want to think about. Uh, we, we can certainly look at artifacts here that Fit illustrate into, yeah. the mm -hmm. story. And, mm -hmm. and in a, I think in a wonderfully warm, pastoral fashion. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, these, these are not implements of war. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, one of these was used Could one time <laughs> to drop on Abimelech's head, mm -hmm. but otherwise, these are <coughs> domestic, they're household. And, and if you even expand it to something mm -hmm. worshipful, this is, this is good stuff. This mm -hmm. is life as it should be lived. Mm -hmm. Hard, but nevertheless a good life. So then let's take a look at um, the, uh, a couple outline. of slides. Mm -hmm. An outline of the book. I actually think the way you told it was better even <laughs> than it's stated here, Larry. So, uh, but we do have famine and we do have fullness, and so that mm -hmm. uh, those mm -hmm. themes tend right. to show up here. Um, now, if we look at locations, because archaeology takes us to sites mm -hmm. and to regions, mm -hmm. and not a lot in this book, 
Bethlehem. We will think a bit about that. It's and ironic, Moab. isn't it, that the, the word Bethlehem means the house of bread or the right. place where you get food. Right. And as the story develops, they, there no longer was a place to right. get food. That's, a, that's an irony that the story just kicks off with at right. the very beginning. Right. So, <laughs> all right. so people would have picked up, if you're sensitive to literary features, right. you would pick up that level. <laughs> Um, I mean, anybody can just hear the story mm -hmm, and understand mm -hmm. it. But the more you know, the more levels there are mm -hmm, to yeah. understand and appreciate. Uh, a map that we've used in the past on this program from the time of the judges. And so we're thinking about Bethlehem, which is just south of Jebus here, and then Moab, the territory over here, east of the Dead Sea. What about this problem of famine in Bethlehem, but grain growing in Moab. How can that be? Well, usually we think of famines as originating from uh, crises and rainfall. Mm -hmm. And it's often said that, you know, you can weather one bad year, mm -hmm. um, maybe eat some of the seed stock. You, you can probably make it through the second. There'll be some hardships in the family. Three bad harvests in a row, and there's death or, the, or you have to go. And oh. Usually people, um, would go to Egypt, to the Delta, where there's mm -hmm. the river-fed agriculture. It is very unusual to go east. Maybe there are other causes of famine. You think of war, social disruption. One might wonder if that's part of the context. Maybe there's stability at that time in Moab, and, and so the crops can be planted and harvested. And protected. And protected. And for. Mm -hmm. We also know that the weather patterns, uh, the rains come in from the Mediterranean, and they drop on the uh, western hills, right. don't See, they? So we have the hill country here. Right. So they, they will drop rain on this side, leaving Bethlehem potentially. Sort of in a rain shadow. In a rain shadow. Yeah. And then you would pick up again on, when on you the come other to the side. mountains on the uh, right. Moab. Bethlehem's right on that yes. transition point. Right. Right. right, right. And so it's conceivable, just from the weather, that uh, there could be a famine in Bethlehem, but not in Moab right, that right, particular right, year. Right, yeah. right. The connections, at least that, uh, that come to my mind uh, archaeologically with this story, the agriculture, we've, we've seen some artifacts mm -hmm. here to illustrate that, but we'll look at some other things. Uh, a pastoral that is herding mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and taking care of sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. Tribal dynamics, we actually find out quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, through archeology span and anthropology mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. tribal dynamics. Um, one thing I do not have a picture of is a threshing floor or a wine press. Um, those are all over the place mm -hmm. in the Middle East. And that would be a good archeological connection, especially mm -hmm. the evening um, um, soiree right. uh, at the threshing floor mm -hmm. in chapter three. And then city gates, lots of business happens at city gates, and we know that archaeologically. And that's where Boaz went, wasn't it, when he wanted to find out if there were other relatives of uh, Naomi who might help to take care of them. He went to the city gate where he encountered the other people right. uh, and had a discussion with them. And uh, that would be the place where those kinds of discussions would happen. Lots of business yeah. takes place at the city gates. A, a general what we what um, anthropologists called a, a mixed economy. What's mm. mixed here, Kent? Well, the sheep and goat herding on one side, and then some agriculture on the other. So you have a mixed economy right. of, of subsistence uh, farming and right. the sheep goat. And so, if things go poorly for one side, they might actually be you might survive on the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here, mixing them. Um, the sheep and goats are, are fertilizer spreaders. <laughs> and so they walk across and uh, eat the stubble and then they uh, fertilize the ground for the next, uh, for the next season's plantings. Mm -hmm. A standard hill country sort of picture. Uh, you notice how the terraces are built in order to catch the water uh, as it comes down the hill from the rain. Uh, there's, so there are little waterfalls off of each terrace during the time when it's raining. Right. And that way the water is spread around to where they need it. Maybe line it with clay mm -hmm. so that you mm -hmm. keep the moisture there. And mm -hmm. it actually can last it uh, can. Quite, yeah, a quite a while. A lot of um, intensive labor to maintain uh, these particular things. Mm -hmm. Kent, what does this look like? <laughs> well, it's a, a plow 1.0, <laughs> the original <laughs> scratch plow. Uh, 
used for millennia until the invention of the cutting board and flipping the sod over. Right. But a scratch plow was all they had. And think of, they would put a, a, a wood shaft through the hole and then um, a hoe, a plow, I mean, this is, it, it could... Uh, and this one's made of stone, poles. isn't it? It's made of stone, yeah. right. Yeah. Right, right. And think of tilling a field with an implement like that. Right, right. <laughs> and then dropping the seed in very thin mm -hmm. scratches. Mm -hmm. I right. guess you'd just scratch it to pieces so that mm -hmm. you would hope that some of the grain... Break up the surface a little bit. Right, right, right. A uh, different kind of implement. This more from recent history. Ethnographic uh, studies. E ethnography, uh, recent uh, practice. And just for people who haven't seen these before, these are sharp little stones that have been embedded in these, these pieces of timber. And you flip those over and ride around. A little boy like that will, will ride around on uh, this instrument and it will cut and thresh the grain. And after it's been all cut up, that's when they come along with the pitchfork and throw it up mm -hmm. into the air, and the wind will separate it into two piles. And you got the chaff yeah. and the. You do that on a bare still in row cropping. Right, right, right. right. I was right. once uh, asked to excavate in that threshing floor in a little town near Hebron, and the village elder said, Yes, you can have this round threshing floor to dig. But you, when you're done, you have to put it all back and tamp it down so that we can use it next season. <laughs> and uh, that was a very interesting project. Right. And then moving to the other side of the equation, now the, the sheep breeding, sheep uh, herding, and so on. And of course, all kinds of resources mm -hmm. coming from Usually secondary things. products, yes. not the meat. They would use the animal for Correct. the milk, the wool, mm -hmm. and then when the animal is older, then they might right, right. Uh, consume and, it. And these just seem so Ruth-like. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they just seem to be part of this setting. Mm -hmm. If we could recreate the setting mm -hmm. for the story of Ruth, we'd have some of these in there. Mm -hmm. We'd have some uh, crops and some activity going on. Okay, what would we have of these? Well, it shows the various uh, ways that people live. Um, they might live in a tent, as you see in the center, or have a cave that's up there on the right. Which actually people used for they do. millennia. Uh, wealthy families might have all of these used at the same time, I mean in the same year. But they would move from tent to cave to a uh, masonry house, um, depending on the weather and what, when it was hot and when it was cold and whether it was stormy and whether it was uh, very dry. Uh, we've, all three of us have worked in uh, settings in Jordan where our workmen live in these kinds of, uh, of habitations. Well, and in Jordan, what percentage of the population now comes from nomadic background? Is right. it 40, 45 percent mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. are the Bedouin? That's and right. so they would, have, uh, they would know these well. Mm -hmm. And so just a couple of images of tents. This with the real uh, goat hair. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them have moved more to burlap or something like that. Uh, what I do like about tents is what they signal about hospitality mm -hmm. and that uh, the, 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 the coffee is on, the tea is on, mm -hmm. and you're welcome to come and uh, join us for something to eat. You never visit a home like that without them offering hospitality. Right, yeah. right. And I'm, that seems so much Ruth-like, too. It does. Uh, yeah. in, in terms of the warmth. And, and point the out what's happening there in the, uh, under the tripod in the previous, well, there, right there. <laughs> yes. There is um, I, uh, a, uh, an animal skin, probably a goat skin, turned inside out, tanned right. and then turned inside out. And that's a churn mm -hmm. for milk products, mm -hmm. for cheese, for butter, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And why not just do it while you're passing along the latest gossip? Right, it's, right. It's, it's a great way to spend time. <laughs> and then more of a settled population here, this from the book by King and uh, Steger on life in ancient uh, Israel. So you've got a courtyard, you've got activities going on, all of it hard work. None, mm -hmm. of, none of this is, uh, is easy to do. And this comes from where? Larry, I think mm -hmm. you know something about this <laughs> university. Yeah, that's... Uh the museum at Harvard uh, wanting to illustrate a four-room house. Uh, this one, a two-story house, which is the typical kind of house that people lived in in Bible times. Right. And then just a rural setting. This is not too far from Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And it just gives a feel so mm -hmm. that you have a place to plant crops uh, as well as herd your sheep and goats. 
the village of Dana in Jordan, which is so illustrative of life in uh, ancient times, it seems to me, yes. uh, in what we would call the Iron Age. And so just some um, pictures to illustrate that harvesting. And now we're near Bethlehem. So mm -hmm. we're talking about where this story actually happened. Um, they just, could easily be Ruth, couldn't they, out there on the... <laughs> I think that's why they waited for a woman to uh, come along for this particular <laughs> photo. Uh, maybe Boaz here. Right, there you go. Um, so, and here's a larger picture of, uh, of, of an olive grove. Uh, terraces, again, terraces were very important in hillside mm -hmm. agriculture. And then uh, this final photo of a gateway. Mm -hmm. Larry, I think you have worked uh, yes. on this site. That's, that's the so-called Solomonic Gate and Gezer. Yeah, and the interesting thing is where you see the individual that's in the picture, he's sitting on these bench, which is inside the gatehouse, and uh, typical of what Boaz did. You have to imagine the side chambers as you go through right, the That's right. The, right. Uh, so the, the central mm -hmm. um, axis here. You can see the sewage channel. The there's a sewage channel. channel that would have been covered over, mm -hmm. and then entry of, you know, at the top of this, um, and then these side chambers. What sorts of things would happen? What can we tell archaeologically would happen in these chambers? Well, we have troughs, evidence, so you mm -hmm. could water your animals or feed them when you come to the city. Uh, certainly, um, well, the men like to sit there. Uh, when the women were working at home. <laughs> but people, the news, people coming into the city would bring news from surrounding cities and villages, so they would keep up with the politics. And by news, you mean, what, gossip or well, information? Uh, informa or both. Both, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, it's much better when told as gossip. And, <laughs> so. and then because you have the influential people of the village there, that's where business transactions would occur. Mm -hmm. The witnesses needed to make right. something right. stick, a deal mm -hmm. stick. Mm -hmm. And commerce, um, selling. Mm -hmm. If you go to Jerusalem today and go into the, to the Damascus Gate, mm -hmm. of course it's a massive gate, mm -hmm. but there's all sorts of commerce mm -hmm. uh, going on as well. Including money changing there now, right. aren't there? <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. So, um, issues involving judges as well, and mm -hmm. I don't mean judges like the Book of Judges, but mm -hmm. judges carrying out cases mm -hmm. and hearing cases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we would um, expect justice to come out. In fact, Amos talks about injustice in the gates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not just say injustice in the courts? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the courts are. <laughs> <courts. laughs> right. So we have that kind of thing. So it's interesting to see how the Book of Ruth fits right into what we know about that period from both history and archaeology. Right. Yeah. I mean, and the story is so beautiful on its own terms. And then to add to it this uh, illustrative value right, of archaeology right, right. in so many ways, the, the, the daily life, um, if we want to think about worship, there's mm -hmm. not a lot about worship, but we could think about that with the chalice here. Mm -hmm. But to think about everyday life and then place in it a romantic, wonderful, beautiful, uh, Hebrew story. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope this has provided food for thought and something for your soul, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark. <laughs>